Hi everyone, Mark here from AmericanNarration.com and in this short video I want to cover the best emergency aeration option available that I know of and how you may be able to save your fish from oxygen deprivation drops in your pond. Uh, we're running into a period of time now in the summer months when people are starting to write in or call in and say I'm losing fish, what do I do? And uh, it's it's just far better to be proactive than reactive, honestly, but uh, I wanted to put this together to give you some idea of what could be done uh, or to, what you could have on hand to help uh, utilize it and put it into action very rapidly to help save fish if they're starting to suffer. So very briefly, I want to cover why oxygen depletion happens in a pond and then what you can look for or signs or indicators that your fish may be in trouble. So dissolved oxygen levels in most ponds should ideally not drop below 5 milligrams per liter. That's not, uh, it's kind of a threshold. Really you want it higher than that uh, and you certainly don't, don't want it much lower. For most fish like, for instance, uh, bass, catfish, crappie, bluegill, uh, really most anything other than trout, a lot of those fish will do great at levels of 6.5 milligrams a liter or higher. And most research has shown there's not any stress or reproduction uh, issues caused uh, in oxygen levels that are 6.5 or higher. Now with trout, it gets a little more sensitive. You typically don't want to drop below 7.5 uh, milligrams a liter with them. And ideally you want uh, oxygen levels to be around 11 milligrams per liter uh, for optimum health for them. But water loses dissolved oxygen retention and capability in temperatures that are higher than 78 degrees, and that's water temperature by the way. The hotter the weather gets, the warmer the pond gets, and the lower the oxygen holding capacity becomes. So it just can't hold on to whatever oxygen it gets out of the atmosphere. Algae and other aquatic plants can also create fluctuations in the DO levels on a daily and hourly basis. During the daylight, a lot of these plants will add a bit of oxygen to the pond, but at night they start to pull or draw oxygen from the water, and that's why a lot of times when you see crashes, they occur overnight or right before dawn, and that's when most people will lose their fish. Uh, overstocking of ponds is also something you need to be aware of. I won't go into detail here, but high fish loading definitely can be an issue if you're, if you're uh, dealing with an oxygen crash. More fish utilize more dissolved oxygen. So signs of low oxygen levels in a pond. You will likely see fish near the surface piping, uh, trying to pull air from what appears to be the atmosphere, but actually it's they're trying to get dissolved oxygen from a very thin layer of oxygen right at the surface. Uh, and that's all they have to work with. So that's a crisis for them. It's a good indicator of a big issue coming. Fish often are lethargic, inactive. They could be slow growing. Typically, they'll have poor appetites, very poor vitality. Of course, fish mortality, usually in large numbers, will be something you'll see as an after effect of an oxygen crash. Uh, some other things you can look at with the pond, environmentally speaking, you could notice foul odors coming off the pond, algae blooms, different things like that. These are indicators that the microbial population that would normally help with some of these things, mo most of which is aerobic bacteria, by the way, is not very well supported, sluggish, dormant, or just kind of crapped out. So um, you can also do some proactive monitoring to help uh, uh, avoid low dissolved oxygen levels. I'll do a video later on that talks about some of these more affordable meters that you could use. Um, but if you start to see signs where your pond is getting uh, around that five milligrams per liter or lower, you might want to start thinking about some ways to intervene if you get into very hot conditions, still days, and just start to see issues with your fish. The best emergency aerator that I know to use, in my opinion, is something like this surface aerator a Casco Marine 2400 AF surface aerator. This is a high volume transfer oxygenating device. It will move a lot of water and really oxygenate. Uh, it is a half horsepower motor and of course sits at the surface which is desirable in this case and uh, I'll take a minute to explain that. Many people 
know how much I like subsurface aeration for a variety of uses in a pond. And it is very good and versatile. However, in an emergency situation, a subsurface aerator is not the thing to deploy. If you don't have it running prior to getting into trouble, this is something that when you install an aerator, typically there is a very graduated startup process. It's very slow because you don't want to stir up too much of the gunk and debris at the bottom of the pond and you will do that when you put in a subsurface system. So it's not ideal for a rapid response. Therefore the best way to introduce air immediately, and I mean immediately, there's no reason to to uh, mess around and stagger the start or pulse it or run it part-time. You can put one of these aerators in, turn it on and go. And it's because we're working from the surface and the aerator is not super large. It doesn't have to be because all we're doing is trying to create a zone of higher oxygen levels that the fish can go into to maintain themselves during these these events. So when you set one of these up, now obviously standard, they come with various lengths of power cables. So if you have power nearby, 115 volt is totally fine, acceptable. That's what most people are setting these up with. They're relatively efficient to run, can be run 24-7. And I think the cable length for the 2400 will run out to 200 feet. But it certainly doesn't have to be that long if your power is nearby. The other thing I'll mention about this aerator, optionally it does come, or you can get a control box, which would have a timer on it. But most people that use these for emergency utilization are just using a, a raw plug-in to power and go. There's no controller or anything. Uh, the other option is a uh, protective intake screen, uh, or they call it a bottom screen, which helps keep debris uh, away from the prop and out of the system. And if you have any debris in the pond or algae or whatever, it's probably a good idea to look at adding one of those bottom screens on. It adds uh, about $240 to the cost, but it will save you a lot of headaches if you've got debris in the pond already. So as I say, you can plug these in and run them whenever you need them. They are very quick and easy to deploy and to get around. The other good thing about this size of aerator is that if you have a remote pond with no power whatsoever or don't want to hook up to power, you can actually use a generator to run these things. Anything greater than 1440 watts will run this 2400 surface aerator. This is an example of one that I found on Amazon, a 2200 watt generator for $389, which is pretty portable and pretty affordable. And then at the time of this video being shot in late May of 2023, the cost of the 2400 uh, base system with a 50 foot cable is $1,203. And so again, it is a very versatile way to get aeration in a pond rapidly. This is for people that may not have aeration going already for whatever reason, you just didn't want to do it or held off and, or maybe you don't want to run it full time, or maybe you have a solar aerator, which is covering you during the day part time and doing okay there. But maybe at night you're worried about fish getting into trouble. Uh, this particular setup, as I'm showing you, could be run anywhere, anytime, and installed and implemented immediately. So to me, it's the best way to get involved and uh, intervene in a low oxygen situation where fish are starting to suffer. So I hope this information is helpful to somebody out there. If you have questions about your pond, pond aeration, etc., get in touch with us anytime at AmericanAeration.com and take care.